Welcome brothers to another Warhammer video. Today we check out God's School Mac Mac Uruk Thraka, whatever his name is. You know, I I'm kind of new to this. But you know, um yeah, you guys requested a video on him and I searched it up and this is the video that came up from Arch Warhammer, the War for Armageddon, the Orc Invader, that's what the actual video is called. I'm just going on um what the Orc is called because he has a pretty cool name. So yeah, this, this continent's got a lot of heresy involved, so be sure you don't watch this near the Inquisition or your local commissar or any space marines or just anyone basically. Just make sure you don't tell anyone about this or we might all die. But anyway, we're going to get into this video man, be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new and yeah, suggest me any other videos you'd like to see and we're going to get into this video. Greetings and salutations friends and welcome back to yet more Warhammer 40k lore. Today in the Armageddon series we will be taking a look at the Orc Invader. And to absolutely no one's surprise, the Orc Invaders of Armageddon was quite the varied lot and as such there is really no list of standard equipment for the Orcs. In fact I would be very surprised indeed if the Orcs even understand the concept of standards. Which means that this episode is going to be a little bit different from the last one, a little bit uh, broader in the spectrum. So, broadly speaking, you can assume that all orcs will be armed with some form of crude ballistic weapon, preferably automatic, that fires as big of a round as possible. The effectiveness of the round is not necessarily as important as the size and the noise. In the orc mind, things like a reliability, accuracy, or handling characteristics are all secondary. Nay, tertiary, nay, irrelevant compared to the important factors, namely light, noise, and recoil. And in all three cases, the more the merrier. The more blinding the flash, the more deafening the noise, and the more violent the kickback, the better. In an orc brain, that means good. <laughs> in regular, in a regular brain, a regular species, that, that's not good. None of those three. You don't want any of those when you're firing any kind of weapon. But orcs, they'll take it. And in addition to this quite literal boomstick, your average orc can be assumed to be lugging around a considerably sized chunk of metal, often shaped in the vague form of a rectangle, and sometimes the orc who owns it will even have made an effort to force a goblin to sharpen the chunk of metal. Note, the chunk of metal doesn't need to be rectangular, it could be cylindrical, a square, a fucking box, or occasionally, <laughs> although rarely, it might even be shaped vaguely like a sword or some form of cleaver. And these weapons are pretty much all the same, and indeed the orcs classify them to be pretty much exactly the same. They are either shooters, or they are choppers. The only choppers. real distinction the orc seems to care about is whether or not they are big shooters and big choppers, or just normal shooters and choppers. As for any human classifications, well, it would be rather pointless to try. The orc weapons are so wildly varied in effectiveness, range, sound, caliber, shape, form, make, and material that any efforts of actually giving them any sort of human classifications would be worse than pointless. But don't let the apparent ridiculousness of the weapons fool you. While the average orc chopper, or indeed even shooter, would be rather useless in the hands of an effete human, in fact he'd probably struggle to even lift the damn thing, much less wield it with any kind of skill, but in the hands of a massively muscled orc, even a hunk of metal will be rather deadly, considering it is now a hunk of metal accelerating very, very quickly indeed towards your squishy bits. Mm. And as for the shooters, while well, again, simply just firing a shooter is likely to break someone's arm if they were human, for the orcs, that's not really a big issue. And again, while they're not likely to hit anything, they will certainly pump out a rather frightening amount of lead, which if nothing else is likely to keep the opposition ducking. Oh, and that reminds me, I seem to have told a slight lie when I said that all of their weapons are either shooters or choppers to various degrees. They also have grenades, or, well, bombs Grenade. more like, but they are hardly worth mentioning, to be honest, as there are very, very few orcs indeed that possess the Buddhist monk-like patience required by an orc not simply detonate such a fantastic source of light and sound immediately after getting his grubby little paws on it. In fact, 
All weapons are so fucking hilarious. They just they just pick up anything basically and just hit people with it. That that's that's the way they go. If it's sharpened, that's nice. I don't care. Just give me just give me some metal. Just give me a piece of fence. I I don't care. I just start beating beating people with it. The uber special kind of orc that is generally trusted to handle high explosives are known as stick bombers. And even if they possess the self-mastery required to not immediately use their new toys, the sick bombers are given one final test. They are handed a grenade and asked to use it. The orcs who throw the grenade are given the title of stick bomber. The one who throw the arming pin are given the title of lunch. And when it comes to armor, the orcs are... How can you be that stupid? <laughs> Orcs are so dumb. How did they ever get grenades, dude? Did they just rub them? Or did they make them? Because they threw the pen. Oh, no, no, no. Just, just lob the pen and blow yourself up. I don't I don't think they'd be given the title of lunch. I think they'd be given the title of, of dead. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, we'll move on. Scarcely any more consistent than when it comes to weaponry. Orc personal protection could just as easily take the form of a complicated powered exoskeleton with 7.2 tons of armor bolted onto it and then finally protected by a complicated force field, or it could simply consist of a single piece of metal strapped to an orc <laughs> boy's chest with some leather straps. And as for the effectiveness, well, it is essentially just a slab of solid metal. Which would be completely worthless for a human, as the sheer weight alone would be more of a problem than it is worth. But for an orc, the weight isn't an issue. And while a solid slab of steel isn't particularly good at dispersing kinetic energy, that also isn't really a problem for an orc. A kinetic impact that would leave all of the various important organs inside of a human body as a fine, mushy paste will do little more than lightly bruise one of the brutish orc monstrosities. Partially because the orcs are so ridiculously massively muscled that that in and of itself would serve as a natural form of armor, and secondly because the orcs have long since disposed of most of those squishy and highly impractical internal organs that have a nasty habit of rupturing from outside pressure. And when it comes to uniforms and regimental organs, <laughs> I can't, I can't finish that sentence with a straight face. No, the orcs do not have any form of real uniforms nor. Of course they don't. All they do is run at you. They just drop and they run. That's all they do. They, they ain't no regiments. As soon as you see an enemy, go smash. That, that, that's the way they see it. Or organization on, well, any level other than this is the war boss. And if you are bigger than him, then, well, you are the war boss as long as you can <laughs> kill the old one. If not, he is the war boss. And you do as he says, or he squishes your head. Though it is also important to mention, however, that while the squishy humans might need specially treated uniforms and rebreathers to survive in the rather uncomfortable climate of Armageddon, the orcs are considerably less effete, and will require virtually nothing in the way of a mechanical aid to live out in the Armageddon wilderness for most of the year anyways. There are certain areas that would be lethal even to an orc's ridiculous physique, but those are rare and far between. For example, the fire wastes during the heights of the season of fire is a little bit too much even for orcs, because their very fat and bodies will start to boil and burn. Which is most certainly a side effect of the local climate that even an orc is going to have a hard time ignoring. Their remarkable physiology also allows them to live off the land in a way that humans would find utterly impossible. They can eat even the shittiest and meanest of vegetation, even the vegetation that occasionally bites back, and they require almost nothing in the ways of a logistical supply system, as they will be able to live off the land rather effectively. And I can just imagine that, like, a plant that bites back and an orc is full on having, like, a, a fight with its plant. To be fair, the plant would probably end up eating the orc. Not <laughs> Where they cannot live off the lands, they will quite happily live off each other, cutting mm. into their stock of lesser greenskins like goblins, squigs, and gnoblars in massive quantities and om nom nomming them instead. At that point, orc society becomes its most brutally simplistic. The bigger you are, the more things you can eat, simply because there are more things that are smaller than you. But if you happen to be one of the smaller things, well, you'd better be really good at hiding. 
The orcs also do not require anything such as a fancy pants medical service, as even severely wounded orcs are excessively unlikely to fall over dead due to said injuries, and where surgery is necessary, they will do so in the most brutal and simplistic ways possible. For example, an orc that has lost an arm might simply have the offending limb stapled back on again. And should mere staples prove insufficient to keep the arm attached, the Mad Doc will simply just go for something a little bit heavier next time, and perhaps just hammer it fast with nails and bolts, perhaps. But of course, at the end of the day, while the average orc might be a simple brute, their commander during the invasion of Armageddon was not such a creature. The orcs was led by the mighty warlord Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka. I will be doing a special video on him to tell you his backstory, which includes him getting most of his brains shot out of his skull by a high. Hold on, I want to see if he actually has done that video. High caliber bullet and then having a piece of metal hammered into place as a replacement. Hmm. And this, somehow, turned him from a simple brute warlord into a master strategist, or at the very least a master strategist by orc standards. The stra So he lost his brain, and they just put some metal in there, and now he's way smarter. I think that gives you the standard of how smart orcs really are. The strategy that Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka developed, and is quite fittingly spearheading, is actually fairly reminiscent of something from our own history. The strategy as a whole is best compared to a Soviet doctrine from pre-World War II and the World War II era, the concept of deep operations, also known as the Soviet Deep Battle Doctrine. Without getting into too much detail, the main concept of deep operation is fairly simple, but requires a very specific set of tools to be effective. The basic idea is to first establish a continuous front line, mm. and then divide said front line into sectors, often several hundred kilometers long. There are very few races in the Warhammer world that is capable of doing this on a planetary level, but the orcs are most definitively one of them. And once this front line has been established, a smaller area of the front line is selected to begin the operation. At that point, vast amounts of orcs and materials are concentrated in said sector, and now we get to the interesting part. Massive and continuous assaults are now launched all along the sector front. Huge numbers of orcs and materials are thrown at the enemy, often for days at a time. And while this gargantuan offensive is underway, the orc commander, in this case Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka, is constantly looking for any part of the front line that looks like it is collapsing or appears to be weakening compared to the rest of the line. And at this point, the offensive is likely to grind on for days, if not weeks, while these weak points are identified, isolated, and plans made to exploit them. And while this is going on, the assaults upon the front line are stepped up once again. Two to three areas of the sector are picked out to be diversionary attacks. In these areas, even more firepower, vehicles and orcs are thrown into the meat grinder to convince the enemy commander that this is the enemy's main offensive effort, and that he should deploy whatever strategic reserves he has left to counter it, or risk seeing his lines collapse. But this is all a ruse. While this escalation on the front lines is taking place, the Orc Commander will move large numbers of mechanized and highly mobile forces to the pre-designated weak points, as secretly as orcishly possible. Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka is even known to have done something so sneaky as to move his vehicles at night. Which mm. might not sound impressive, but trust me, for an orc, such a level of tactical and strategic consideration is fucking mind-blowing. He's a genius by orc standards. Yeah, like I said before, orc, orc's usual war war um, tactic is run and smashy smash, but, you know, they actually have some tactics. So yeah, there you go. And if this level of development continues, then at some point in the not-too-distant future, Gazgul might even think of ordering his orcs to turn off their headlights. 
But such minor trifling matters are hardly important. The important part is that these breakthrough forces are now placed to exploit the previously identified weak points. These forces are composed of all manners of fast vehicles that, once again, pretty much defy all effective classification. The vehicles can be everything from single-seated bikes to massive mobile battle fortresses carrying upwards of a hundred orcs at a time. These forces will also contain massive amounts of firepower in the shape of heavy mobile artillery, tanks, and Titan-class walkers, generally referred to as gargants. These offensive forces are also frequently supported by bombing raids, both strategic and tactical, and while orc precision bombing is all in all more likely to kill orcs than foes, <laughs> the occasional bomb that finds its merry way to the enemy is deemed to be worth the collateral damage. And so, finally, the trap is sprung. With the enemy stretched out along a long front line, the orcs' mobile forces punch through the identified weak points and continue pushing deep behind the enemy's lines. Some amongst you might have heard of a doctrine that sounds somewhat similar to this particular phase, generally referred to as Blitzkrieg. But the main difference is that while Blitzkrieg was designed to surround and annihilate large numbers of enemy forces in pincer maneuvers, deep operations has no such objective. The objective is extremely simple. Large formations of troops will punch through the enemy's lines and continue as deep as they possibly can penetrate, while constantly having more and more men and machinery pouring in through the gaps, or in this case, orcs and machinery. In short, the objective of Deep Operations Doctrines is not the destruction of the enemy's army. It is rather the destruction of the enemy's nation, by causing the entirety of the front line to collapse as huge numbers of enemy forces pour uncontrollably into the enemy's rear lines, disrupting communications, logistics, and taking over strong points and defensive positions before the enemy can even retreat. Whereas the objective of Blitzkrieg would be to dissect and then obliterate the enemy's armed forces, thereby making the nation incapable of continuing the struggle, Deep Operation seeks rather to obliterate the nation, thereby rendering the armed forces entirely pointless. However, being the smart subscribers that you are, you will probably already have identified a bit of a problem with this particular doctrine. Namely, the fact that it requires the application of absolutely overwhelming force to be mm. effective. For deep operations to be truly effective, it requires an absolute hammer blow of epic proportions. The doctrine requires you to vastly outnumber the enemy forces along virtually the entirety of the front line, while also maintaining adequate reserves to not only keep the assault going for days, if not weeks, but to also escalate the assault as needed while you keep your most powerful units in reserve. This, as you can imagine, not only requires hilarious amounts of soldiers, or orcs in this case, but also ridiculous amounts of material, both in the form of ammunition and vehicles. Continuous shelling needs to be kept up. Opening barrages needs to be fired off before the infantry charges, if you don't want them to simply be butchered even more horrifically. And tank losses will stretch into the thousands. And then, of course, there is the purely human cost. Even a nation as populous as the Soviet Union was almost driven to destruction by these tactics. No yeah, this, this does not sound like a very, very good tactic. You need so much people and resources that, really and truly, it's only, only something you can do if you seriously, seriously outnumber your opponents, and you seriously don't care if your people just keep dying. So maybe in real life you shouldn't use it, but for orcs... <laughs> It's fine for them, because they're dead, it's right around in their billions, so yeah. Not to mention the simple fact that it gets progressively harder to order people to charge defensive positions as the mound of bodies grow outside mm. of their trenches. Not if you're from Krieg, but you know. But for orcs, this is the perfect strategy. <laughs> 
they don't have to worry about things like morale. They don't have to worry about stuff like access to orc power. They will be more than capable of outbreeding virtually any amount of casualties. And as for materials, well, the orcs are masters of cobbling together crude machines of war from practically anything. And as for the production of materials of war, ammunition, foodstuff, etc, all of that is taken care of by the orcs' very own slave race, the Gretchens, and occasionally the slaves of the various races they are currently fighting. The Gretchens, and the slaves by the way, also double as a handy food source. For Gazgul, Mag Uruk Thraka, undoubtedly the hardest part of carrying out such an operation is not managing the casualties or having enough troops to send into the meat grinder. If anything. Hold on, I'm gonna guess this. It's actually making the orcs wait to run and start killing people, for sure. Or to just listen to him. Probably. The hardest part would be to keep his reserves from simply charging off headlong instead of attacking the weak spots that he has so carefully I knew it. designated. During the first war for Armageddon, this strategy was still in its relative prototype form, and the great beast of Armageddon did not have the numbers that he would eventually come to have during the second invasion. This meant that, while you can definitely see traces of the tactics used during the first invasion, they were not as sophisticated. For example, it was relatively common for Gazgul to kind of lose control over his more advanced units. Instead of heading for specifically designated strategic points, the various hordes of rapid moving orcs would simply just stream ahead to whatever area they would wish to loot, or whichever area offered resistance. Rather than avoiding the retreating enemy forces, these rapid penetration troops would instead just circle back and engage the rearguard of retreating enemy formations, which made the entire maneuver rather pointless. Mm. And lastly, a quick note on orc vehicles. As you can probably tell, they are a rather ramshackable lot. In fact, most of them don't look like they should be able to move without falling apart. And in mm. normal hands, this would be entirely true. However, they look like some Mad Max odd vehicles, boys and girls, really. They, they look so poor, they, they look like they're like something out of Mad Max, like they've been built with scrap metal, which they probably have to be fair. Orcs are a rather interesting little species. They are connected to the Immaterium, the warp, in a way that is very, very unique. Basically, they can manipulate the Imperial Tides without conscious thought. They are, in all due essentiality, magical beings. They believe that these vehicles will function, and so they will function. You might even go so far as to say that the vehicles are surrounded by a sort of force field holding them together. But this only really functions as long as there is enough orcs, and as long as they are in proper orky morale. If the orcs were ever to be reduced in numbers, or sent scattering, their vehicles would very quickly break down. And additionally, if the orcs are reduced in numbers enough and scattered from the main invasion force, which is what happened after the first war for Armageddon, they will quickly turn feral and lose practically all sense of technology beyond the most basic of weapons. This can be seen in the feral orc population inhabiting the equatorial jungles of Armageddon after the first war. These orcs were the descendants of the original invaders, but their technological prowess has degraded to such a level that they are now reliant entirely upon stone club and flint tipped spears. These very same orcs were once able to operate and even build, in many cases, massed formations of vehicles, battle fortresses, gargants, and even crude airplanes. But with the decrease of their numbers, so does their quote unquote magical abilities. If the feral orcs were, however, to join a larger throng of orcs, they would quickly be able to use more advanced weaponry again. Although in many cases, said technology will often be influenced heavily by their savage selves. For example, they might take one of their favourite boars and slap on lots of cybernetic bits, an engine, and wheels, and essentially make a cyborg boar capable of fulfilling much the same role as a bike. And okay. finally... As more or less promised, a contest, this time for Warhammer 40k Armageddon Da Orcs standalone expansion. You do not. 
Okay, that's the end of that video, man. Thank you all for watching. Uh, I thought this was going to be more about Gazgul, but uh, it's not. Uh, I, I did look for a video on him, but this was the video that came up. I'll search right now, actually. There's really no video detailing him. I don't think Arch has done one yet. Um, but yeah, man. Hopefully, he does one soon. Or if not, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of guys here that do youtube that watch me i know there's definitely one or two of you that that do it if you want to make a law video on gasgall that could be easy and easy views for you guys man and it could be could be good for you but anyway thank you all for watching this video man be sure to leave a like and subscribe man and yeah i'll see you all next time